I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Beth, you ready to rock? Yep, I'm ready to go. Great. Everyone, thank you for being with us here today. I'm Lori Ward. I'm CEO at Washington's National Park Fund. Uh, we're doing great as an organization, all things considered right now. Uh, we have a 23-member board of directors and seven staff people. We're hovering around 1.2 million that we've raised so far this year. Have a couple more months to go. Excited about the possibilities there. Today, we're gonna hear some from Beth Fallon, who is a plant ecologist up at Mount Rainier National Park. And her job is just to learn about and take care of and restore and educate about the, the wildflowers at Rainier, which are always just a huge draw for people you know, across the country, people in the Puget Sound area and people around the world. The biggest question that Beth gets, we understand is, you know, when are the wildflowers at their peak? She'll talk a little bit about that with us today. So with that, I'm going to say, do you have your backpacks on? Do you have your lunch sack ready and your water alongside? Let's board the virtual field trip and head on up to Mount Rainier. With that, I welcome Beth Fallon. Thanks for joining us here today, Beth, and um, go ahead and take it over. All right, I'm just sharing my screen. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen adequately. So. Um, Thank you so much for joining me on this trip to Mount Rainier. Um, and you might imagine yourselves walking uh, up from the closed forest and seeing a light up ahead on the ridge. And as you emerge out um, of that closed canopy, you might be happening into the subalpine meadows of Mount Rainier. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. And I want to talk about how these, these gorgeous areas um, that so many of us value and love and, and love to to find relief in the, the summer flowers and the, the fall colors um, are, are also areas here, my slides aren't moving, um, that are in some ways overlooked and have been used for um, many purposes and need to be protected and restored. So I'm going to talk both about those plant communities and also all of the work that's been happening at Mount Rainier um, to uh, restore those communities to what we think are their sort of original condition. And as Laura said, I'm a plant ecologist at Mount Rainier, so that means that I am uh, in charge of a program that oversees kind of all non-mobile things. Uh, so vegetation communities, plants, mosses, um, and also uh, uh, fungi and lichens. And I am relatively new to the park. I started about a year ago now. Um, so I am still kind of lumbering up this path of learning about the place. And of course, I think you could spend a lifetime here and still be learning, but I'm still taking on just all of the work that's happened here. And uh, a lot of my past research has been on um, why plants grow where they do and what about their adaptations to climate um, and what about their functions, help them grow where they do, and then how vulnerable they are to climate change. And also about um, uh, how we can detect uh, those vulnerabilities and changes that are happening in plants. So um, while I might have done that in a different environment, I think that Mount Rainier is an incredible place to think about those same kinds of things as we have a lot of plants that are kind of living on the edge. Um, especially in these subalpine and alpine meadows, plants moving into previously disturbed areas, plants trying to, you know, sometimes flourish and sometimes eke out a living um, with really short growing seasons. So I am maybe like this knick-knick, just poking my head uh, above the snow and, and learning more about Mount Rainier. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what I've learned so far today. And a really exciting thing about working at Mount Rainier is just how much research has already been done here and how much work has already gone into conserving the park and restoring and protecting the park. And the Washington National Park Fund has been a massive part of that. Um, they have funded the Meadow Rovers program, which I'll talk a little bit more about and perhaps many of you have been a part of. Uh, it's a group of really dedicated volunteers who work to educate the public um, and protect public safety. Um, in the meadow trail systems that we have here at Rainier. And they've also funded these really large restoration projects. So um, funding the work of the greenhouse here at Mount Rainier and the actual planting 
and also trails work, which helps move people around the meadows in the ways that are safe for them and also protect these kind of vulnerable ecosystems. And they have also been a part of organizing volunteer events to make this work happen. And so without the help of the Washington National Park Fund, a lot of the things in this talk might not have been possible. So when we think about alpine and subalpine systems, we are thinking about those systems that where the canopy of the forest opens. And so uh, Rainier and a lot of Cascade systems are so incredible because they have these closed, dense forest canopies dominated by a few species. And then as you move up, you come into maybe some subalpine firs, the tree species change, and they start to become a little bit more sparse. And those um, subalpine fir woodlands um, are where the subalpine system begins. So somewhere around 4,500 feet in elevation, 1,400 meters, um, moving up to tree line. And then after tree line um, or tree, tree form trees, as you move into Krumholz, you're in alpine systems. And I'm going to focus a lot on subalpine today, but there's a, a bit of fuzziness there in between those two systems. And of course, one thing that really defines the systems here is this very short growing season. So um, in, the, in the northern hemisphere, plants have a, a short growing season um, in the summer, just the time where it's actually warm, where the sun is nice and high and they can grow. And at Mount Rainier, that season is even more abbreviated because the snow doesn't melt out um, until about you know, late July. And this year, it's just melting out right now. But what that means is that plants have to do, the plants above below that snowpack and that melting snowpack have to do everything in a really abbreviated amount of time. They have to, to leaf out if they didn't have leaves before, they have to start photosynthesizing, they have to put out their flowers, they have to put out their seeds, they have to resist all kinds of insects and they kind of do it so, so quickly that we get this gorgeous phenomenon of having um, multiple species blooming in one area. So like out here in the Sourdough Mountains, you can see multiple species blooming, and if you're lucky, you can also have a pika yell at you while that's happening. So I have a question for you all, if you want to take a poll, um, many of you are much more experienced in the meadows than I am. When do you think uh, peak bloom is in the meadows of Mount Rainier? Um, August 15th, 45 days after the snow melts. Um, would you rather just like ask the bees or someone more knowledgeable? Or if you have a different idea, go ahead and put it in the chat. And I'll give you just a, a 20 seconds. Okay, so I see um, almost 60% of you said 45 days after the snow melts. Um, I, I like where 21% of you are, you're just going to ask the bees, that's a really good idea. Um, and some of you have some different ideas. So uh, the, the answer is kind of, um, it's really that snow melt is the key, uh, though I don't think you could go wrong following the bees around Mount Rainier. Uh, and we can uh, hopefully not misuse this incredible research done by University of Washington researchers to look at uh, the number of species and flowers by that, that day since snow melt. So here there's two lines and we'll focus on the green line um, and the, the number of species and flowers is that peak. So the, more, the higher the peak, uh, the more species are in flower at one time. And you can see at about the, the Jackson Visitor Center elevation at Paradise, around 5,000-ish 5, 5, feet. Um, there's a couple of peaks, and it's maybe about you know, 40, 40 days after the snow melts. And on the high ridge at a higher elevation, more around Pan Panorama Point, where there's an even more abbreviated growing season, plants are really all flowering, almost 10 species, about uh, 35, 40 days after snow melts. And this, um, this chart also shows something that I think is interesting, which is they found that in a year in when the, which the snow melted almost 50 days early, so that's a month and a half early, that's really um, dramatic. And they use that as an analog for what might be happening during climate change. Um, the timing of that, um, of that flowering shifted. So they actually were um, 
flowering earlier in the year, but a little bit longer after snow melt. And so what was happening is different species were flowering at different times when usually there are some species that would all flower at the same time. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about climate change later on in the talk, but that's a, an interesting phenomenon is as, as we think about peak bloom and timing your visit to Rainier right to see all the flowers you want to see, um, that might be changing in the future with different timings for, uh, for that snow melt. So uh, if we want to think about the plant communities that grow in these subalpine areas, I'm going to talk about both the plant communities and then also start to talk about that vulnerability they might have to human uses um, and, and then how we can work to repair that. So here's just a view of the trails that Paradise taken in um, the very beginning of July last year, a very different year. Uh, the snow was gone earlier than it was this year and there was less snow then. But what you might walk into um, pretty soon after entering the meadows there are, are these lusher basis subalpine meadows. So um, there's uh, Sitka valerian, there's this um, American Falls Hellbore, which I love. It's on the, uh, in the right photo on the, the right side. It's almost like corn, corn leaves for much of the year. And then it has these uh, not super showy green white flowers that hang down. And these species produce really large fleshy stems. So they're actually vulnerable to trampling, not only because they're gorgeous meadows that people want to move through to see the flowers or the bees or the animals that they were looking at. Um, so there's a heavy usage in the area, but also because they have to produce these large fleshy materials, trampling them um, costs them a lot of investment basically. So as the magenta paintbrush are pushing up to get more sunlight um, and to get their flowers out there and the lupins are, are um, being quite showy, that any step on those stems is a cost to the plant. Whereas the wet subalpine meadows, so these are meadows, um, plants you'll encounter where there's water near the surface or at the surface um, in these subalpine meadow areas. Um, these are a little bit less vulnerable to trampling, um, luckily, and that, but that might change if the areas dry out. And they have these really gorgeous um, flowering uh, plants that are quite showy. So we have the mountain bog genshin, uh, a kind of blue, blue flowering plant or a personal favorite, the Jeffrey shooting star. I, I love all shooting stars. They're so showy. Their flowers are just inverted. So they show off the like anthers and stigma uh, at the base of the flower. And so if you see those, you'll know you're in an area where there's water quite close to the surface. And as you move up in the meadows um, or in a drier, a drier location, perhaps more exposed, um, you can come across these dry grass meadows. So green fescue will often dominate and then it'll be punctuated by uh, cascade aster or other flowering plants. And a really interesting thing about this is this photo is from near Brown Peak uh, in the sourdoughs. And on this um, slope here, it's dominated by fescue and there's a little Sitka valerian in there. But then on the slope that I'm standing on taking the photo, it was this lush meadow full of hellbore and um, other plants that we would associate with those wetter meadows, and that was the north facing slope. So while it might seem that these um, communities can be a little bit delineated, they also run together really quickly and it changes just by um, the water availability by the average temperature there. Um, and so there's a lot of diversity in a, in a small hike in these subalpine meadows. And then finally we move up, as you move up in elevation, you'll move into these heath shrub systems. So these are dominated by plants that are in the um, heath family. So cute little bellflowers um, related to manzanita. And the pink mountain heath will show up first at lower elevations and move into a yellow mountain heath, not, not shown here. And Merton's mountain heather is all around as well. And these systems are quite vulnerable to trampling. So they have these woody stems that can be up to 70 years old. So each individual stem, the plants could then conceivably be older. They form buds on the stems um, so that they're ready for the next year and they keep leaves all year round. So there's a big investment in each stem. And so when they're trampled, they can lose a lot of material. And even though they produce a ton of flowers and a ton of seed, they're in environments in which it's really hard to get established. Um, the, uh, 
plants have to germinate at the right time and then they have to be able to succeed for several years as fairly small plants um, when lots of things want to eat them and the weather is not always perfect as well. So when, when heather gets stepped on, it's a real concern and it, it doesn't take uh, many passes um, as research has shown to make that kind of a, a permanent problem that needs active restoration. And then I, I don't want to just focus on the flowering plants because we also have very charismatic trees in the subalpine and alpine areas here at Mount Rainier. And of course, one of the most charismatic is white bark pine. Um, something really wonderful about it is that it is often incurred in these very structured um, fir woodlands where the trees are, you know, they have a nice fir structure, very conical. And then the white bark pine are these kind of fluffy, fluffy plants out there in the landscape. And they are um, really important to the ecosystem. So not only are they one of the few species of trees that moves up into the Krumholtz area and provides habitat and provides shelter for other plants um, to start to germinate in new areas, but they also provide a really important source of sustenance for multiple animals, including uh, Clark's, nut, sorry, Clark's nutcracker, which rips open the cones and and caches so many seeds that it can't eat them all, and those plants then can germinate into new white bark pine. And unfortunately, uh, white bark pine is suffering um, in the United States and you know in the uh, in the Washington State because of an introduced uh, fungal rust that can infect the stem and effectively girdle the tree. And with enough infection, the plants can die. And Luckily for us at Rainier so far, U.S. Forest Service researchers have found that some of the seeds collected here, um, the, the trees grown from those seeds are more resistant to the rust than um, some other uh, plants collected in the area. So Mount Rainier trees might have a good chance of being able to, to outlast this disease, but white bark pine is a, a tree that's, um, you know, quite sensitive and is a, a candidate for listing as an endangered species. And we this year, um, with the North Coast Cascades um, Inventory and Monitoring Network of the National Parks, are hoping to finish installing plots to monitor white bark pine, see how many are being recruited and regrowing in the subalpine and alpine areas, and um, how many are, are affected by the blister rust. So we talked a little bit about those plants and, and um, how gorgeous they are, and also which ones are might be vulnerable to, to, to human use. And uh, of course, paradise has been heavily used for, for quite a long time, and especially as settlers moved into the area and were able to access paradise, there were large camps installed um, so people could you know, appreciate and recreate in these gorgeous meadows. And some of those uses, um, seem almost, um, they're a little bit hard to fathom now um, in management of the National Park. So 100 years ago, there was a golf course at Paradise. And on the right side of this photo, you can see the Paradise Inn and Paradise Inn Annex um, up, up there above the golfers with a, a gorgeous view of Mount Rainier. And of course, we don't have the golf course anymore, but we still heavily use the meadows. They're accessible, especially Paradise, especially Sunrise. Um, they're an easy way to move around and have gorgeous sights to see all these plants. And, and the trail system is really well maintained. Um, so there has been really heavy, heavy visitation in Mount Rainier. And that is both what the park is intended to do, um, and, but also a challenge for keeping the ecosystems intact. And that challenge was recognized, um, you know, throughout the, the lifetime of Mount Rainier National Park, but in the 19, 1986 and 87, uh, park staff undertook a very intensive inventory of off-trail impacts in Paradise. And so they um, tracked any area which was disturbed. So this could be from off-trail hiking. It could be from um, historic uses. It also could be from rather than hiking, uh, a resting area. So some people just need a location to rest and there aren't necessarily benches everywhere in paradise to stop and sit. Um, and some of the hiking has uh, different reasons. It's to get around a, a spot where there's still snow that's late to melt. Um, might be to find a faster route or it might be to get to a better viewpoint. And the, the um, 
the park staff then uh, quantified the extent of disturbance, including mapping the whole trail and mapping how eroded the soil was. And that's a real issue because of the further erosion, um, as you can see here on the right, the harder it is for anything to reestablish there and more of a kind of a water flow disruption exists. So here you can see the trail system of Mount Rainier in orange, um, the fairly extensive trail system, uh, starting with um, in this lower part here, this is where the Jackson Visitor Center and the Paradise Inn are and moving up uh, the, the trails. And when we put the whole map of all the, um, the impacts, keep in mind not all of them are as bad as others. Some are quite intense and some are um, just a few passes out into the meadows. We see this vast network emerging. And so what was, and I'll, I'll pop back, what was this trail system providing kind of a large patch of meadow in the middle and some nice patches between the trails so that when you look left and you look right and you look forward on the trail you see these meadow systems becomes potentially a, a, um, a really divided set of ecosystems uh, or sorry this really divided set of little meadow patches rather than um, one big meadow system to move through. So the park was really concerned about that obviously and wanted to make steps to fix this. So one, one thing that they did was engage with um, researchers on how to prevent uh, people walking out into the meadows. Um, and there are a lot of efforts that you can still see today, uh, signage, um, roping off areas so that people don't walk on trails that are not actually maintained trails. Um, there was some recognition that um, sort of punitive efforts were helpful finding visitors, but that wasn't the way that parks wanted to go. So the Meadow Rovers was an output of some of that research, which found that having a uniform presence on the trail deterred people from walking off trail. And I think they took that in a step in which it became a really positive thing. So rather than having a uniform presence just to deter, um, they turned themselves into this um, highly trained group of volunteers that um, educate visitors on the meadows, um, on, on why they should stay on the trail, but also on what activities are available to them and just became an engaging presence on the trail. And so last year there were 136 volunteers um, that were meadow rovers in Sunrise and Paradise and the meadow rovers each volunteer at least eight hours of their time, often more, and they are supported by the Washington National Park Funds. And Anyone can um, become a metal rover that's interested and wants to give a little bit of time. And you can look on volunteer.gov to become a part of it. And it's also a really accessible activity. So your level of activity and your level of comfort with engagement, I think are both flexible. So if that's something you're interested in um, becoming a part of, you can certainly reach out on volunteers.gov or sorry, volunteer.gov and um, become a part of it. And then of course, uh, there's that effort to keep people on the trail, and then there's an effort to restore the existing impacts. And that was um, especially vast. So in the 80s and 90s, there were um, really impacted trails, highly eroded, and there was a, a large effort to stabilize those areas so there wasn't further erosion, including um, flying in soil and stabilizing supplies um, berms and other ways to stop soil erosion and filling in those trails. Um, many people who've worked in the park or who still work in the park um, at some point in their career worked on this restoration project. So it really um, brought a lot of people together and many volunteers have worked on this over time as well. And the, the plants used for restoration, the areas that were seeded or planted um, are collected in the park. So we keep things quite local. We're not only concerned about restoring the species here, but we're concerned about restoring the genotypes, those, those lines, those lineages of plants that have grown in Rainier um, for a long period of time. So plants that are planted out at Paradise for restoration or plants that are planted out at Sunrise for restoration are, are collected from those areas. And the seed collection and seed cleaning is done here in house. And as of now, the, uh, those plants are grown up in our greenhouse. And last year, our horticulturist, Josh Trown, grew 70,000 plants to plant around the construction footprint of the Paradise Inn Annex. Um, and so there, and a really great part of this is the plants don't have to travel far. We know where they come from. Um, 
And there's a, a high diversity of species that can be grown. And the plants are planted out in um, communities that kind of mimic the surroundings. So there's not a monoculture of sedges um, or a monoculture of uh, lupin, but rather an effort to mix those plants together so they, they mimic the surrounding community and hopefully blend in um, and start to look like a natural community sooner. And of course that restoration couldn't happen without on the ground intensive efforts to put those plants in the ground. Um, and so that takes a really skilled crew. We have a, an incredible revegetation crew here at the park and it takes hundreds of volunteers. And it's quite possible that many of you have been out and have planted some plants at Mount Rainier. Uh, this is along, uh, I believe, part of Dead Horse Creek uh, Trail a couple years ago. And then um, last year, there was a large effort to replant around the annex, so to, to take away that bare ground uh, around the construction footprint. And uh, we also had over 130 volunteers come for various events to, to plant plants there in what was a very rocky ground and a very wet uh, fall. So people have really put effort not only into not stomping the meadows when they're visiting, but into replanting the meadows when they're here. And so if we revisit that, that map, that kind of terrifying and garish map I made of, of the impacts on the meadows, and then we superimpose areas in which we've actually made some efforts to reinstore, restore those areas, we've done a pretty good job over the last 35 years. Um, many of these are, were critical areas, so they were highly eroded and they have received at least some restoration effort. So everywhere in green has had like at least some effort put forward to reducing that impact. And if you see this plot, this is um, each bar is a level of severity. So the lowest bar is a, a pretty low impact. Maybe that's only a few passes. Uh, it might have restored on its own. And the highest are these critical areas. They're really deep um, trails. They're very unlikely to restore on their own. And at least 70% of those trails have received some kind of restoration many of them planted and seeded. And the same with those very high severities are about 50% have been stabilized and about 20% planted and seeded. And I think our, our next steps are, um, besides continuing this restoration, are to go back and look at what's been done and um, how successful it is and carry those um, methods forward and help us reprioritize what, our, what we're gonna do. And, a big future for the park is this idea of continuing the restoration of paradise in a holistic fashion. So this year, um, the trails crew is embarking on an incredible effort to reroute part of the Skyline Trail at Marmot Hill. And in the photograph here, you can see the trail as kind of a cutout um, uh, on both sides of it, and it's pretty denuded and water flows down it. So it's hard both for uh, hikers to navigate that area without going off trail. Um, and it's, it's, also, um, it's also making it difficult for plants to grow and vegetate in there. So the trails crew has highlighted a, a different area that'll be more resilient to use, um, that will be probably less likely to degrade over time and will allow visitors a, a way to navigate clearly through the path. And what re the revegetation crew here, what we're gonna do is salvage plants from that trail, so those heather plants, and replant them out in the surrounding community so we can let them continue to grow at least nearby where they started. Um, and then after they finish that work, we can uh, restore the old trail so that its footprint isn't there anymore and that when people move through that trail system, not only will they not contri contribute to further degradation, um, but they'll get to see the meadow in a, a perhaps a more uh, original state. And then after that, what's, what is the future of restoration in the meadows? And I've chosen this um, gorgeous picture of fall in paradise um, because it also shows these little fir trees moving into the meadow systems. And that movement of trees into meadow sy systems um, is both a kind of natural successional process, but it is also a process that is probably exacerbated by changes in meadow use and certainly by climate change. So we know that um, climate change changes the meadows. So we know that climate change especially affects mountain systems. And if we were to imagine that Mount Rainier was a perfect little triangle, like, um, like my triangle here on the left, as 
the temperature is warm in the year, that's going to change snowmelt timing, make it earlier like the plot we, we looked at earlier in this talk. And it, it's going to force plants that um, need cooler weather uh, to move up the mountain. And it's going to force plants that um, uh, don't like it as cold or can't withstand a snowpack, like those little subalpine firs, those plants can then start to occupy new areas. Um, so it's going to change the communities that we have on the mountain. Um, and it's also going to have interesting effects um, that are hard to determine what to do with. So I show here the um, Mount Rainier lousewort, uh, this little yellow flower plant. And it's an endemic to the Mount Rainier area, uh, which means it grows just here and in the surrounding lands. And it, so it doesn't grow anywhere else in the world. And what happens is it has a relative, another kind of lousewort that's also bee pollinated and they can hybridize. And one thing that might be happening is the reason that the, the Mount Rainier lousewort can exist as its own species is because it's been uh, often separated from that other lousewort. And as climate change changes their ranges, they actually come into contact more and are more likely to form hybrids so that we might lose one species and gain sort of a hybrid of another. And those um, uh, problems are hard to know what to do with. Um, but I think there are other ways that we can, um, we can adapt. And I also think something that we really need to think about is acknowledging um, the lands, historic lands of indigenous people and also their potential to acknowledge their traditional meadow, man meadow management techniques. And so of course, Mount Rainier National Park um, has multiple Indian tribes that are associated with it, the Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, Muckleshoot, Yakima, and Cowlitz. Um, and we know that there are different ways that meadows were managed before white settlers moved in. And I think that those uh, methods have been often ignored, but with something like meadow, with trees moving into meadows, if fire was a, a management technique um, before the formation of the national park, that might be a really great way to uh, restore those meadows um, in a in a way that agrees with historic management of those meadows. And I think that's something that we, we should acknowledge and, and, and try to work with to bring into our management techniques. And I also think there's a lot of opportunities for research in our restoration program here. So one thing I would love to think about more as we know that plants, we've been planting out plants in these rich, diverse communities is are there, um, certain plants that we should plant first um, that are, will help facilitate the growth of other species. And I think this is a great opportunity for academic researchers um, or other independent researchers to get involved at the park um, and take advantage of our great resources at the greenhouse here and in the field to see if perhaps something like planting lupins first, which are, can be enrich the soil with nitrogen would help facilitate the growth of other species and make that succession more natural in the restoration, perhaps more successful over time. And we might also think about where in the meadows um, sensitive species may succeed with a changing climate. The climate is changing. We of course have an opportunity to kind of halt that climate change, but it's already warmer now. Um, and depending on when action happens, it could, it could get a lot warmer. But the advantage of the, the kind of complicated topography of the Paradise Meadows and the other meadows in the park is that there might be little areas, um, small berms, small dips or hollows, where the temperature is cooler there. And those small areas might act as a refuge for certain species. So if we have a highly degraded area that has this kind of micro topography, can we, can we plant some more climate sensitive species into that micro topography so that we um, can give them a refuge until we can fix our own problems. So I think there's a lot of exciting things that we can do with this research, uh, or so we can do with restoration to make the, the meadows, um, the meadow restoration successful over a long term. And I'm very excited to continue doing this work and see what happens in the future. So thank you all for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, Beth, that was terrific. I, I, I love listening. That was really great. Thank you. Nice job. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, I have a few questions. And I first want to say that 
when I first started in this position, I went up to Mount Rainier and I saw volunteers alongside the roadway and they were pulling down on the branches and I was curious and I was with the superintendent of the park at that time and I said, you know, what are they doing? And he explained that they were indeed pulling seeds off of the trees, going back down to the greenhouse, which is all inside the national park, planting them there, helping them to grow. And then in the fall, they took them up to, and all those volunteers that you showed us, they took them up and planted. And I, I find that striking. I just, I'll never forget that because it makes so much sense and it all stays. So there's no or less nat um, non-native species and plants. So I remember that very well. We have some questions coming in from folks. So I'm going to get to those. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Beth, what do you know what causes a super bloom? Oh, oh, well, so I guess I think of the super blooms um, in like a desert context. <laughs> and that's just a year in which there's a lot of moisture. So I guess here that um, it could be that I think there's often the, there's a lot of conditions that are, are right. So not all plants may put on a ton of flowers every year. So it might just be the right input of moisture um, and the right seasonal timing. So here, I'm not actually sure I would imagine and, and don't take my word for it that it like a later snow melt might force plants into kind of a shorter uh, blooming period. So you might see more plants blooming at once than you would normally. So maybe that's what this year will be like. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, here, let me read this. Oh. If it's not a secret, where in, is the park's greenhouse and is it open to visitors? Oh yeah, so the, that's a good question about open to visitors. I don't, um, <coughs> that our administrative area, which is down in Ashford, um, in the, so it's the Tahoma Wood section, that's where the main building is, but there's no um, like a visitor reception area there, but it is open uh, to volunteers. And there's certainly a lot of work if you are, um, if you are skilled or want to become skilled in gardening and the, um, the fine art of cultivating native plants um, and you're quite patient, I'm sure there'd be a place for you there. <laughs> Thank you. And Mark, you're welcome to reach out to us and we can get you in touch with the right people there if you're interested in taking that further. Um, this is a kind of a tongue in cheek, but why did they take the golf course away? I, you know, I don't know. Um, many years I, I ago. I would say because it wasn't a great idea, but maybe it just didn't, maybe it wasn't profitable. <laughs> maybe. Um, could you address the issue of invasive plants in the park? Sure, I can, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so there's, we do a lot of treatments of plants, both manual and chemical, and those are mostly on the roadsides in the park um, because that's where we see the most um, uh, introduced plants. And of course, uh, introduced plants do better in areas that are disturbed um, just because they have an opportunity to grow. Um, when there are fewer things there, there are fewer competitors. So we, we manage a lot of plants on the roadsides. Um, and we have a crew that's doing that right now. And I actually think they are incredibly successful because I, when you drive into Mount Rainier, um, for many of our entrances, there's a, a stark contrast between the roadsides that you came from and the roadsides in the park. And they mirror um, more closely what um, the plant communities are surrounding that road. Um, in Paradise Meadows, there are some invasive grasses and there are some, I think it's primarily grasses now that we're really focused on because we don't want them to expand into the surrounding meadows. And of course, with the disturbance that we looked at, um, there's an opportunity for that to happen. So um, as visitors, the best thing you can do is clean your boots before you come to the park um, and clean your equipment before you come to the park, shake it off um, in, uh, a, not in a parking lot here, someplace outside the park. And also, um, if you're like me and have a weedy yard, like shake it off in your weedy yard and see what grows, but don't bring it here. I have never heard that and it makes complete sense. <clears throat> it's like boating, right? Yeah. Boating and yeah, in the, in the species that can get on the, the propellers, etc. cetera. Um, let's see, Rex tells us, thanks so much for doing this, Beth. He's a meadow rover at sunrise and it's very helpful to learn things that 
he can then share with visitors when he's out in the park. So thanks to you from Rex. And I have a few more that came in before our, our time. Excuse me just a second. Um, <clears throat> I understand the park is, if, I, if the numbers are still standing, is at 150% of snowpack right now. Is that right? Is it still well, or? Yeah. No, now, now I think, well, I haven't been up to Paradise or Sunrise. I'm going up next uh, week, but I think now we're pretty well into the melt. But it was, you know, um, just several weeks ago, still quite high. So we did, we had a late start um, for snow. It felt like there was very little snow. Um, and then a lot of snow in the kind of peak of the season and it should be melting out now, so. Thank you. And uh, we have a, a friend who says, I'm disabled. She walks with Canadian crutches and hikes on trails whenever possible. She often finds trails that are mo mostly accessible to her, but then occasionally gets a step or a tree root that's just too much for her to navigate and get around. Is the trail restoration efforts taking accessibility into the equation so that folks like her can maneuver better? Yeah, thanks for that comment. That's a really good question. I think that's part, that's something we really need to be thinking about as we think about, I kind of talked about that holistic approach to like, how can we think about restoring so it's not just planting or it's not just moving a trail, but it's, you know, moving a trail so that people can move the way they need to so they don't have to walk off the meadows. And um, I, I will take your comment into consideration and make sure I move that forward because it's certainly we certainly do need to have trails where people can move around so they don't have to turn back, but also so that they don't have to walk around as well. That's right. uh, and we do have plans to bring Jim Ziolkowski, who heads up the trail maintenance at Rainier and has done so. He's a good friend of the fund. We will be bringing him to one of our future um, virtual field trips. So we encourage all of our friends to join on. We have time for just one more. I'm gonna try to get to, excuse me, uh, let's see. Uh, for eroded trails, especially those th that are in size, they're um, much deeper than wide. Do you know how to stabilize that so that they can become restored? Yeah, so they, um, there was a lot of work done with this and pretty dramatic uh, trails. And I, don't, I didn't have the right pictures to show you, but there's certainly um, what the crews are doing here. It's where they were putting in bars, like often um, stumps or, or other wooden posts. And then filling in with um, sterile soil or other soil that's not introducing path like potential pathogens and just filling in that area so that um, and I think breaking up the soil because the compaction compacted soil can be like as impermeable as cement essentially mm -hmm. so they were putting in physical barriers to stop that erosion and then often planting on top of that to retain the that fill there thank you Beth uh, as we begin to wrap up, I want to share with everyone, again, I want to call out you, Beth. It's been really terrific having time with you today, and, and you're just so smart, just so smart. <laughs> um, let's see, two weeks from today, we will be featuring PSAR, which is Preventive Search and Rescue, and we'll have some folks from um, up at North Cascades with us. Actually, just FYI, be watching King 5 if you're in the Seattle area. They did a news story, they will be on this very important topic to all three of our national parks. So be watching for that. In 2019, the fund gave uh, over $90,000 to Mount Rainier, especially for the programs we've been hearing about. So everybody who's out there and has contributed, thank you so much. You're, you're very much a part of that. You see some statistics there as well of the difference that the volunteers are making in meadow restoration and meadow, the meadow rovers, the impact that they have. Thanks also to Subaru and especially Subaru of Puyallup who stepped up and honored Washington's National Park Fund and especially Mount Rainier National Park in December of this year with their Share the Love campaign and that generated a very nice level of support for, the, for Mount Rainier, for meadow restoration in particular. Uh, stay tuned with us every two weeks through the summer months. Uh, save the date. We have a, an online auction starting up in a, a couple weeks, August 3rd through the 7th. Lots of exciting things that will be coming online that you can bid on and be a part of. 
Uh, and then just a, something we're doing, we're announcing right now is that on September 30, we're planning to do a year end celebration and kind of a three cheers for the parks. And at that time, we'll be sharing, you know, the projects that we'll be funding and recognizing some very special people from each of the three parks. So mark your calendar for uh, Wednesday, September 30 at 5 p.m. Um, again, I know that all of you join me in saying a special thanks to Beth Fallon for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate Beth. You did a great job. So thank, thank you. you and yeah. have thanks a great afternoon, everyone. Take care.